God is self -aligned. So there's, uh, but that's 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 what they do. So um, oftentimes when I'm talking to atheists, I actually have an easier time talking about the way to atheists. If that's my background, that's the perspective I can speak from. Um, and oftentimes they, the faults that they see in other religious people, even though um, if they actually sit down and talk to me, then uh, they realize that I, I haven't got the same weakness as all Just a fanatic. I'm just a fanatic, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they might not be able to understand me, but at least uh, they can see that I don't break the rules, I guess, that they've set in their life, where by, you know, I, I jump to these illogical conclusions about things. Um, obviously, life and way and truth is completely logical. Um, logic isn't the only part of it, but uh, there's nothing in the way and there's nothing in the truth that contra contradicts logic, so, uh, which is uh, something that atheists find quite surprising, I guess, when you do talk to them about it. Um, any other? Uh, it was just to make mention of, yeah, both both are basically the error, taking the same error, which is um, interpreting life through the lens of a, the physical uh, senses and um, just drawing different conclusions upon that. Religion, actually, on the other hand, it's the atheists, you could say, are also invoking religion uh, in a lot of sense because, yeah, they go and they reject that there's anything other than this physical evolution that they teach in schools, etc. Um, yet that's outside of many of the experiences that people naturally have through, you know, whether it's near-death experiences, psychic phenomenon. Um, so when people go and look at the history that's not taught in the schools, they're going to say, well, you know, there's a, there's a, a shortcoming with this atheist teaching, and then they go and they look for answers, and of course they don't have the capacity to look within themselves for the answers, so they go and they accept whatever it is that somebody's preaching to them and, and try and look for the answers from, from other people. Uh, or they just look for a good social venue, I guess. <laughs> don't worry about the truth at all. Which is what it is. Uh, anyhow, some of that does relate to the, the main topic I wanted to discuss, which is the nature of man. Um, why there's so many people that have this desire for government to be their god, uh, for government to provide them security, for government or a church or someone to tell them how to live, what to think, uh, and yeah, the importance of a strong foundation. The I want to do some contradistinction between the foundation that the U.S. has versus Australia. That's uh, where I'm at. And that would have a nice tongue sticking out, probably, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was checking to make sure nothing were obvious. Okay, so, lately, I guess, there's been some stuff in the news about how, um, <laughs> Sorry, I my lips. I'll stop in okay, so, okay. uh, Yeah, there's been some stuff in the news about how those, how people that are uh, physically stronger tend to be more conservative in their political views. Um, it's actually further than that, and that, yeah, you can say that, yes, anybody that is weak or feels vulnerable, um, and... Yeah, insecure in what they're doing. Oftentimes, they're looking for other people to tell them, tell them what to do. And there's obviously a, another group of people that are more than happy to step up and tell the people what to do. Uh, so, I guess at the at the moment, you've got the U.S. is uh, probably suffering more than it has in the past um, by this psychosis of fear that's been caused by terrorist attacks. It's um, the inevitable challenges posed by having flawed economic models. Uh, 
uh, that have been in place for well, more than 80 years. But uh, some of those economic models have inherently within them, um, the construction a, a problem where eventually they create more and more distribution of wealth issues uh, as, as a nation progresses. And then you've got, uh, on top of that, economic hardships brought about by um, a government that wants to add layers of bureaucracy to anybody that has a, a good idea and wants to uh, uh, start a business or work on uh, some way of creating wealth. So all of these things have come together and they've created uh, a sense of fear in a lot of people. Um, you go and you look at what types of people have the ability to overcome this fear and, or the attributes and um, you know, there's some groups that stand out as being a little bit different when you talk to them um, and, and those groups, some of them are just as lost from a truth perspective as uh, people on the left that uh, are looking for government to step up and, and be their god. But uh, yeah, you got people like the religious right. They they have in place of government. They get I guess their courage, if you like, from from their faith. Uh, even if their faith is misplaced in many ways, they at least have some faith that gives them a sense of security, whether it's real or not. Uh, they've also got community around them, usually, and that gives them a, a real sense of security. Gun owners. Um, when I'm looking at the U.S. from the perspective of Australians, uh, there's a very different confidence, I guess, that you can see in people that, uh, that tend to own guns. I mean, in Australia, they, I don't know, they're very much sheep, and uh, I find that when you have a high gun ownership, you tend to get a, a group of people that are kind of more willing to step up and say, I'm not being told what to do by my government, but my government works for me, um, which is you know, a strong, uh, strong attribute that the U.S. has to protect, and you know, obviously the the Second Amendment was put in place to do that, but uh, I think a lot of Americans going, particularly on the left side, they, they don't see how when you lose that means of um, letting the individual protect themselves, protect their family, protect their communities, how much that undermines the, the strengths of the individuals that make you know, a country like the U.S. what it is. Uh, martial art tends to do the same thing uh, amongst people, particularly in countries like you know, a lot of the Asian countries where personal gun ownership was outlawed by the, the emperors or regimes that took over, they go and outlaw weapons. So uh, in those countries, people soon became martial arts specialists in order to try and reinstill that sense of self-confidence and that sense of uh, being able to protect yourself, protect your family, and that. And if you get a whole community of people that are good at martial arts, um, then you can see that same sort of uh, the confidence and the ability to stand up to government, stand up to what's not right, uh, that you do need people with guns. So I guess it's two different ways to achieve a similar sort of outcome where you basically are taking responsibility for yourself and equipping yourself with the ability to uh, protect what you value. Um, another, another population, I guess, if you like, that tends to be more free from the reins of government or the rural populations. Um, their separation, generally they live a lot more independently. Um, they work in the land, they're a lot more connected with reality in a lot of ways because of that work that they do with the land. And they know what they can do on their own. They know what they need their neighbors for. They know that they don't need government to hand hold them uh, through, through every event in their life. Um, on the other hand, you've got people that are entrepreneurs that have gone and stood up against challenges in their life and have 
have overcome those challenges. So they have a self-confidence that's been built up through that process. They've, they've developed wealth from that. That wealth is also gives them some sense of security that they have the means to uh, means to protect themselves and the means to uh, to overcome problems. They don't feel that they need a government to sit there and uh, sort of as an economic uh, security blanket. And uh, and I guess the last one, which is the most important, uh, is the group of people that are, are spiritually advanced and they have a perspective on life where they can see why things happen and, uh, and they're probably not caught up so much in... Um, yeah, they, they don't fear it because they can understand it. So, uh, and I guess the last group that I wanted to mention was just those that are in the trust, in the trust that they have someone from one of those other groups uh, looking after their interests. So, um, you know, our children and that, a lot of the security they get isn't from, you know, being religious and being a gun owner or being an expert fighter. It's um, in the security that they get from having parents that they know are, are capable of working after them, that, that they see standing up for them when, uh, when things are wrong. So, um, on the other hand, those that are mentally weak and fail to take those responsibilities to equip themselves, uh, they naturally go and look towards government. And, um, and right now, I guess in the US, you can see that it's starting to approach a tipping point where you know, you're almost getting to this point where there's a majority, majority of your high court, or the Supreme Court, is just about at a, a point where it's wanting to throw over a lot of the protections that we've got. Uh, you've got a president who is definitely on the socialist side of the spectrum, and um, you can still maybe in, in your house of Congress, but uh, Congress and Senate. Um, I actually think when I see the, the stalemate that's been created by Congress, it's, uh, I see that as a positive thing, and that while we haven't allowed a lot to go forward, at least they have served you know, some ways to stop the regression of, of the country and losing the strong foundation that does make the U.S. have the strength that it has. Um, and I just hope that they can hold back those changes until, uh, until such time that uh, the people are able to wake up and see it. But, um, we're at the stage where in order to move back from, from the abyss, there's probably going to need to be violence. There's going to need to be something that shakes the people and wakes them up. Because uh, while the U.S. has fallen a long ways from where it used to be in uh, valuing freedom, valuing liberty, valuing uh, freedom of religion, life, it is, uh, it's still a, a big step up from what most other countries have. And, um, so there's still a lot worse that it can get than what it is. I guess it's a, the one strength that might stop it from getting to work. The worst thing that could happen, I think, for the U.S. is if there is this long, slow decline into mediocrity, you know, being mediocre in the way that other countries are mediocre. Um, the, what I'm hoping is that there's enough diversity left in the U.S. with. Um, the things that cause the U.S. to sometimes have more uh, vivid clashes than in other countries is that you know there is that diversity of, of nationalities, there's the diversity of, of thought, diversity of religion, and it's in having that diversity that gives gives it the power to um, to achieve what it's going to achieve, just like the diversity within ourselves if we can promote it and, and um, you know cause increase to each of the spheres of mind, that's where we get our full potential within ourselves. That's also where a nation, where a community. Um, so everything I'm talking about for the US at the moment is something I guess I'd also like us to keep in mind when we're looking at setting up a community is how do we set it up with a foundation um, that instills these same principles and um, encourages people within that community to stand up and develop a persona that appreciates the diversity amongst everybody in the community and um, 
and promotes everyone becoming manifesting the highest level that they can. So, um, anyhow, uh, what I wanted to say is the difficulty of maintaining freedom if that foundation is not there. Uh, many of us were there when we set the foundation for this country. Um, hopefully we can do that again with the community. I wanted to offer, I guess, a perspective of sort of an opposite using Australia. Australia is sort of regarded as this um, peaceful nation. It mostly is. The people are very nice, friendly, they've got nice beaches, and you know, they've got everything pretty well handed to them from a resources perspective. It's a low population of about 22 million people in a very resource-rich country. So um, they have absolutely every advantage that could possibly be given to them, uh, along with great climate and everything else. On the negative side, the government has been run by the unions. So basically, the heads of all of the major unions get together and they decide who's going to be the leader this week. <laughs> kind of changes regularly. We just had a change in prime minister here two weeks ago. Um, no elections or anything. It's just the heads of the unions get together and decide we're not going to win the next election with this leader, so let's change it up. Um, we have our constitution that's only upheld when it's convenient. The, um, Australia has an interesting history, I guess. Most of you know it was uh, a British colony, so it was set up. Basically, the British government gave it its constitution, and it had a constitution on the colony. Um, back in World War I, when it sat up, uh, it took part in the war was recognized for the efforts that it made in the war um, that gave it the criteria needed for it to become a nation in its own right. Uh, so from that, um, basically almost 100 years ago exactly, uh, Australia became its, its own nation and uh, somehow they forgot to change the constitution. So they still have the constitution of colony even though they are supposedly a standalone nation. So they, they kept the British Queen, even though the British Constitution prohibits the Queen from becoming uh, a monarch of any other nation. Um, so if she actually acted within the capacity that the Australian Constitution says she has to act, she would actually be charged with treason under the British Constitution. So she's um, essentially for the last hundred years, uh, they, all of them, the Constitution in Australia basically just goes and says, this is how the government's going to work. If you're going to create any new laws, this is the process you have to go through. This is how the, um, the state's uh, distribution of powers go between the states and the federal government. This is, uh, if you're going to create any new government offices or officers of the government, this is the process that needs to go through. Um, however, because they Australia became independent of Britain 100 years ago. Technically speaking, any of the laws, any of the offices, any of the appointments that have been made in the last 100 years have technically been unconstitutional. So the federal the high court of Australia has essentially ruled that in any time that there's a conflict between the Constitution and, and the law, if it would essentially destroy the system of government that's in place. The, federal, the high court will always rule um, in accordance with not what the Constitution says, but within whatever it needs to rule in order to uphold the system of government that's created. So, um, where in the US, the, if, if any law stands in opposition to the Constitution, that law will be struck down. Um, in, in Australia, they actually have a very weird situation where the, they have a constitution that stands up there and the high court says if there's any law that would get struck down that would harm the government, we're not going to touch it. We, won't, we just won't apply the constitution to it. So, um, yeah, there is essentially the weakest possible foundation contradistinction to what Australia has, so I'm sorry, to the U.S., I thought it would be a good, uh, a good contrast. And um, 
within our Constitution, as weak as it is. There are no human rights protections. Um, it does prohibit the government from in, uh, infringing upon, the federal government from infringing upon um, religious freedom, but it doesn't prohibit any of the states from doing so. And since all, most laws that affect you on a day-to-day -day basis are by state governments, um, basically we have absolutely no uh, religious freedom at all from most of the, most of our governments. Um, the only thing really that the federal government does is immigration, money supply, interstate trade. Uh, so we can't have our religious freedom inhibited <laughs> by those, but uh, yeah, everything that hand is handled by state government. Um, yeah, when I went in, I did my seatbelt challenge. The argument of the, the prosecution was that the, the, the powers of the state are completely uninhibited, and um, they they have the full power. Uh, there there is no religious freedom, and they have the full power to essentially do whatever they want. So they didn't even argue that my yeah that they were breaking my my religious freedom by by bringing up charges against me, um, I said it doesn't matter, we, we're we not, the, the plenary powers of the state are absolute and without challenge. The, um, yeah. So um, it makes it a very difficult place to fight for government, like if, sorry, fight for your freedom. If you wanted to set up a, a community like this and had it have it fairly uninfringed upon by what the government tells you you have to do. You would have to find some way of doing it in a manner, well, well uh, yeah, you just have no, no power at all. If the government goes and says, we are going to um, yeah, just make a ruling that it's illegal for you guys to congregate together and communicate, we've already taken away your guns, so we know that you're not gonna be a problem that way, and uh, we have, plenary powers of the state mean mm -hmm. that we can rule and tell you to do whatever you want, whatever we want you to do. Uh, anyhow, this is the direction I see that the U.S. is heading. It's a long ways from there. Uh, the U.S. still stands as the, the place in the world that protects freedom better than any other, but it is sadly quickly becoming, uh, rolling down, becoming average. And, uh, the U.S. interestingly created the U. contributed quite a bit to contribute making the U.N. Um, back in I don't know, it was the 60s or whatever. Uh, so they've gone and set up world courts and they've gone and set up international law. Uh, the the seatbelt issue. I went and I held up one of the arguments that I gave to the Australian courts was that under international law, the freedom of religion and conscience is, is protected. And uh, the, Australia is one of the signatories of that law. But they say, yep, we're one of the signatories, but there's no legal requirement for us to uh, actually abide by any international law within the country. All you can do is go out and lodge a complaint with the international court, and if you win, it goes on their record as saying Australia is known and it gets added to the list of everything else Australia does that's against international law where they've already said it, so um, <laughs> nothing happens. Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting situation. Uh, so you would think that without human rights protections, that the Australian people would want those protections. But in the last, you know, since that constitution was set up uh, in uh, 1896, so the last 120 years, there's been five referendums put forward to actually instill some sort of constitutional protections of human rights uh, within the Australian constitution. Some of them even fairly minor rights, but uh, 
So basically it is in referendums where the people of Australia have been told, here, we're going to give you protections in the Constitution. Do you want that? And in all five cases, Australians have turned it down. <laughs> so, uh, no. <laughs> we don't want that because if you go and you protect my rights and freedoms, you might give somebody else the ability to uh, stand by, you know, it, it basically you'll give somebody else rights to stand against a law that I might agree that the government's put in place. So um, it's like I don't want any protections for myself because I'm afraid somebody else might use those protections to protect them. And uh, given, I guess, that it was started as a penal colony for criminals, maybe, <laughs> I don't know if that's what's behind it, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that, you know, as a people, if you went and you did that same thing here, there would at least be some vivid discussion about it. There would be something you would have about two sides that would be in sort of this vicious argument about it. Over there, it would be a snooze. Uh, yeah, there might be a couple of newspaper articles on it. There would be no argument. You wouldn't hear anybody talking about it on the streets. You'd certainly have no protests. Um, the only place you can actually go over there and hear a group of people talking about the importance of freedom is the gun club. Um, you go outside of the gun club and you don't hear a peep. <laughs> so, um, because it's one of those groups that likes to stand up for itself. Um, the religious people over there, I don't, I don't even know if you can call them religious. They're only sort of religious by convenience only. They're the most placid uh, religious group that you can imagine in all of the churches. Um, yeah, it's, it's a social club. And uh, they... I went to the Seventh-day Adventist church there because I wanted to try and find a community where I could take my kids and they could, you know, we could go and have some friends and, you know, there would be vegetarian food and that kind of thing. So there's a, a Seventh-day Adventist church not too far away from where we live. And you can go and do Bible studies and stuff and sometimes invoke some thought in people by going and giving them a perspective, which was all fun, but go there and go to their social events, and the ones that were at the church were all vegetarian, but the ones that they held at the parks and stuff, uh, they had absolutely nothing that was vegetable. They had, everything was meat. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's just, you have these very soft, like you know, on the Seventh-day Adventists, most of them are meat. Um, there might be in the church, the, the minister and one or two other people that might be vegetarians. Um, even though they go and they preach and they, they preach and they say, you know, the, the best lifestyle is that of a vegetarian. Ellen White has all of these writings on the importance of a vegetarian diet. Um, but yeah, predominantly it's a social club. They love the social aspect of it. They go and say, yeah, I should one day. I'm Samoan or I'm whatever. It's in me to eat meat. Couldn't do it. And um, it's a good thing I've got my Jesus going. <laughs> anyway, um, so, yeah, we've got five failed referendums giving people some form of rights. Uh, we also have high violent crime rates, which surprises most Australians, but if you want to actually look at the rates of crime in Australia, we have a very low murder rate. Particularly murder rate with guns is what is it? Uh, two per, two per hundred thousand or something, uh, which is a lot lower than what, is, than what uh, the U.S. has. So, so that's the one stat that any time the topic comes up, the government's the only stat that they'll ever publish is gun murder rate. Um, but if you look at other violent crime like assaults, robbery, um, etc., Australia stands at a crime rate of two to anywhere between two and four times higher than the U.S. Um, so there's, uh, I think the rate of uh, rape is about four times higher than the U.S. And um, yeah, there's assaults, etc. It's starting to get uh, some drug gangs in the Gold Coast. Um, there's 
probably a shooting every couple of weeks. It's a fairly small population, though, because Australians think that they're in a very safe country because, again, they've got a low population. Um, they hear in the news all of these shootings and everything coming out of the U.S., but the population in the U.S. is so much bigger that, and is a much more active news reporting. So most of our news on violence still comes from the U.S. <laughs> People have this perception that it is. And I guess there are demographic areas that do have problems here in the U.S. So. But uh, anyhow, so there's a, a perspective on Australia most people have this perception of Australia as this, this, this peaceful nation that respects freedom and everything, but um, it's only on a very shallow level, and it's only if you agree with what the government is telling you you should be thinking. So, um, anyhow, did anybody have comments? Just wondering if uh, <coughs> the uh, pro freedom groups uh, who have the this, or maybe it's just Minnesota. Uh, it seems to me every time you know, someone who's into martial arts, they have one of the guns and they're also into motorcycles. And and motorcycles? Yeah. And because you want to take responsibility for your own safety and your own safety. Yeah. I don't know. Um, in my motorcycle club, there's only a few of us. Sorry, in my karate club, there's only a few of us that have motorcycles. <laughs> there isn't really... There's motorcycle gangs over there that like to fight each other and stuff, but there's not really, um, and there's some motorcycle associations, but they're not very politically active, the associations. Um, okay. I know in Canada, it's quite frequent. Talking to someone who's in the martial arts and the martial arts, many of them, I'd say the majority, that's the right reason. Yeah. I am. Um, often when I'm going to karate and back, I don't wear a helmet, because it's only not too far from my house, I don't have to go that fast, so. I like having a helmet if I'm going at highway speed because it's too noisy in my ears. <laughs> my hat will fall off <laughs> doing so. <laughs> um, but yeah, the karate club doesn't really even. I figure I'm in more danger when I'm going and getting kicked in the head than I am uh, on my motors. <laughs> so it's. Sensei is uh, from South Africa, so he's used to getting to choose what, he, what you do. Anyhow, that's probably it for my talk then, if nobody else has any comments. state government, 
try and stand up and work that off the best I could. But the Constitutional Foundation in, in Canada, I guess, uh, it's in some ways opposite of that of the Australia. In Australia, the The states basically are given. Oh, sorry, in, in Canada, basically each of the provinces is given specific powers, with all the residual powers going to the federal government. In uh, Australia, it's the other way around, where there's specific powers given to the federal government, residual powers going to the states. Um, so the, one of the key differences, I guess, in Canada is they have a bill of rights. Australia's, I think, just about the only Western country in the world that doesn't have any sort of bill of rights, uh, whether in its constitution or just as an act. So there's been a lot more laws struck down under the name of law. Yeah, there's been laws struck down under Canada's Bill of Rights. In Australia, there's never been a law struck down. <laughs> I won't bore you anymore. When you're talking about the governments of the earth, they have no authority, in most cases, to do what they're doing. Because they don't meet the valid criteria of the higher order. But since they know nothing about a higher order, they just lost renegade governments. But they're telling people what to do. Aren't they basically a reflection of the people then? Probably. Likely. But that doesn't make them valid. Right, I'm not saying it makes them valid, but it's sort of. It's there, for, it's, there for, it's there for a pattern for people to go and see in that pattern. I themselves. have no right to tell you what to do. I have no right to lay down requirements that you have to live by. Neither does the government. Mm -hmm. um, man does not own the earth. The whole concept of tickets, speeding tickets, and stuff like that. Now, maybe I have the right to defend myself, to live in a small community of like-minded people, to disassociate myself from those who don't want to live by our standards or our way of life. But I have, the no, I have no right to invoke any worldly secular power to tell other people what to do. And that's the only right I have to give to my government. So that's the only power I have the right to give to my government, is the power that I myself possess. Government should always be neutral. Because the government should never be in a position where you're fighting the government such as if you're wronged by a business, the government should be able to step in and decide, step, defend your individual rights as a person, as a offspring of God. The more socialistic you get, the more you're battling with the government. And that should never be, and that's invalid. And those who ascribe to that end up in places like Castro's Cuba, Stalin's Russia, China's Mao, Hitler's regime. All these governments exist because when people get the opportunity to throw off or create good, right governments that are lawful, they're usually more interested in gaining some advantage for themselves by denying other people advantages. And that's illegitimate. Like you talked about, well, they don't want to create laws because that'll give somebody who they don't agree with an advantage or, or, or a right. They don't want to give those people rights. Well, then they don't have any rights. And a, com a country like this right now is an opportunity. Being an American is, be is a religion in and of itself. It's a higher religion than most religions. Because within the constitutional framework, all these other opinions, and all these other religions, and all these other philosophies should exist. 
all to seek their own destiny. Now, the, by design, the constitutional framework said the government is not allowed to interfere with these opinions, with these ideas, with these communities. But of course, the law of octaves have corrupted the constitution of the former government. And now that we slowly, they're walking down the path of becoming illegitimate. And those who then support illegitimate government inherit illegitimate government. Any thoughts on that? Everybody's always trying to fix what's wrong. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong. There are no accidents. There are no... Every, every event is orchestrated, has a pre-existing cause. So whatever you... It's like I saw it said to them earlier, one of the most important commandments in the Ten Commandments is not to desire what belongs to your neighbor because your neighbor has what God's laws provision from. You have what God's laws provision for you. So does everybody else. Fix your own laws and your life will change. There's a reason you were born into the life that you were born into. Whether it be a slave in Ethiopia or a whatever it is. There's a reason, pre-existing cause for every event <coughs> in this world. And in not understanding the laws, all you're doing is enslaving yourself. Now government should always be the neutral factor. It should be there to acknowledge man's God-given rights that's supposed to be unalienable. Inalienable. And it's there to protect those rights. Stops me from infringing on your rights. Stops a company <coughs> from infringing upon your rights. You should never have to fight the government because the government should not be in a position of authority except to protect the rights of the people. Anything of government beyond that is illegitimate. Socialism always fails because it's illegitimate. It dumbs down the people because it's illegitimate. Another way to look at it is we only have, you, know, you look at man is created by God, government and other institutions are created by man. The only thing we can legitimately or, or pass on is the powers that we ourselves possess. So if it's legitimate government, it's only carrying out an extension of the powers we have as individuals within our homes to be carried out on a broader scale. So we have the ability to protect ourselves and protect our homes. We have the ability to create government that can protect our freedoms. Uh, we don't have the ability to go and snoop on what our neighbors are doing or go and take from one neighbor and give it to another neighbor. We don't have the power to empower our governments. We don't have legitimate power to empower our governments to do the same thing. Another important part of the Ten Commandments and the law is to not have weights of partiality in your application of the law, of the life. So there's no doubt that at one level, Policemen are needed. 
somebody's got to do the job because people can't, are not willing to live by the law. And so governments, worldly governments, create these police forces. And probably the worst thing, worse than our present form of government, would be if these patriot groups ever got in power. Because if you didn't agree with them, they'd probably kill you. That would be really fearful. Um, but anyway, so a policeman is working at this level of consciousness and he's going out giving people tickets. Well, he's judging these people and he's an instrument to the law. But that's his job. But his tests are going to come whether he uses equal weights in all his judgments. And he himself speeds. Well, not only he himself speeds, but will he let the son of a politician off the hook? Will he let a fellow cop off the hook? These are his tests, and most of them, of course, fail them. So they end up being outcasts from the laws of man and being judged and harassed by the laws of man. Then when they get back into life and they complain about how corrupt the laws are and the police are and all the rest, they inherit what they themselves invoke. Now, if they had done their job initially honestly and followed what I would deem in the Ten Commandments as having not actually in the Ten Commandments, but it's in there of importance, equal weights in all your dealings with all people. If they had done that, then they would have overcome and prevailed. And they probably would have went on to something better than being some dumb traffic cop or even a cop. But because they've failed the test, they're going to get caught in a karmic loop and they're going to become renegades of unlawful legal authority of this world. And thus, it goes on and on and on. Every part of life is a test. And what's necessary is to hold to the code. Well, if you're not going to hold to the code, you better have a really important reason as to not to apply it. Better be an act of mercy that's going to benefit people or situation. This is why most governments are illegitimate. So they have no real power. Of, it's their own power that they're doing. And they'll be responsible for the abuse of the power they're impacting on other people. So when we do get a community together, we have to figure out how to create a government system that serves to protect the legitimate. If a child of an Essene lived outside of the community rule, they were simply shunned and forced out of the community. Nobody did anything to them, nobody beat them, nobody punished them. You either live by our rules or you don't live in our house, our community. That's the only lawful thing you have. You don't have to associate with those who don't want to accept your community rules, your way of life. And probably a community would be best set up in three levels, with those who have earned spiritual maturity or community maturity living in the center, those who are interacting with the community but from a worldly perspective living in the outer core, just like the original church was. They had it was a healing system where it had three phases. It had the good news for the multitudes. It had the esoteric teachings for the seekers. And it had a spiritual core of those souls who had overcome and prevailed and connected with, the, with God. And each was basically separate but yet under one umbrella. Now the inner core was always used as the standard to achieve by. 
in our society, we condemn those who are successful. We make fun of them. Those who God gives ability, like one of the things that our old friend Chad always threw at was Gnostics or elitists. What makes them think they know what other people don't? Well, they work at it. Work and they dedicate their life to it. The core of the church was always Gnostic, because that's the objective, is to communicate with God. And that's what Gnosis is, spiritual knowledge. You don't get spiritual knowledge through books of dogma. You get spiritual knowledge by interfacing with God directly. Are these elitists? Damn well they're elitists. They're doing what they should, and the others are doing what they shouldn't. That's their choices. Now, the original church didn't turn them away. Like Origen said, there's some helps in the gospel for those who are sick. Others for the healing, who those who want to be healed, and those for the pure in heart. So it was a it was a threefold church. Well, any spiritual community should be the same way. There's always going to be like in the Amish community, the outer fringes of the Amish could be considered the Mennonites. They're like halfway Amish. They dress like the Amish. They, in many ways act like the Amish, but they do have electricity, they do have cars, and they do have telephones, which the Amish don't. And usually most of the Amish communities, what I found years ago when I interacted with Amish and with Old Order Mennonites many years ago, was that there was always Christians living around, sincere Christians living around the Amish communities who concealed who they were by appearing to be Amish. And this way the authorities didn't interfere with the way they raised their children and other things. Because the authorities looked at them as if they were Amish because they had beards and whatnot or old order Mennonites. Now, by appearing to be part of the group, they had the safety of the group. And this way, the government didn't interfere with them. And since in Pennsylvania, especially, the Amish are an institution that attracts tourists and revenue, they basically have a hands-off approach to the Amish. And they tolerate the old order Mennonites. And of course, you have a whole bunch of other people who they don't realize aren't either Amish or Mennonites. They just use the Amish as a shield so they can live according to their religious beliefs and not be Amish and not be Mennonites. I don't know if they had the same thing with the East Hasidic community in uh, Brooklyn. Um, because there was, because uh, the, the, the Hasidim generally won't have anything to do with downstream Jews. That's all I have to say.